In eukaryotic cells, there are two different types of cell reproduction, mitosis and meiosis. Today, we're going to talk about the similarities that these processes share, as well as the differences between them and why they're important for different types of cells in eukaryotic organisms. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Eukaryotic cells have two different types of cell reproduction that occur within them, mitosis and meiosis. Both mitosis and meiosis have a lot of similarities. For example, the processes of actually separating the chromosomes during the, cell, during the karyokinesis process is remarkably similar. The cell cycle leading up to the mitotic or the meiotic stage of a cell is also remarkably similar where we're going to be replicating the chromosomes and doing all the things that happen during G1 and G2. On the other hand, there are some significant differences. For example, mitosis is only going to occur in somatic cells or the body cells of a multicellular organism, whereas meiosis is only going to occur in the reproductive cells called the gametes of a multicellular sexually reproducing organism to produce the sperm and the egg. Mitosis is also a process of high fidelity. It's going to lead to the production of two identical diploid daughter cells. On the other hand, meiosis is actually designed to encourage genetic diversity, to encourage diversity among its daughter cells. And as a result, meiosis end product is going to be four non-identical haploid daughter cells. So in this video, we're going to examine both mitosis and meiosis very closely. And as we go through both processes, we will look at the similarities that these processes share, but we'll also look at where they diverge from each other and the reasons why and the importance of these differences. So first, let's start by talking about mitosis. Now, as I mentioned, mitosis is going to occur in the somatic or the body cells of a multicellular organism. So when we talk about mitosis, before we get to the mitotic stage of the cell cycle, remember we have to go through G1, S phase, and G2. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about these because we cover them in a separate video on the cell cycle. So by the time that we get to the end of G2, we get to the mitotic phase, the cell has already replicated its chromosomes, and as a result, there are going to be 92 chromosomes in a human somatic cell undergoing mitosis. So what will this cell actually look like? So prior to the first step of mitosis, which is known as prophase, if you looked at the nucleus of a, of a human cell, there would be 92 chromosomes present. However, they wouldn't look like you would expect them to, because at this stage in G2, the DNA is being utilized to do transcription and translation and for other purposes. And as a result, the, the genome would be a mixture of heterochromatin, tightly wound DNA, and euchromatin, loosely bound DNA to proteins. Prior to moving into prophase, the first phase of mitosis, that DNA is going to condense into heterochromatin. And as a result, you will start to see things that resemble the, the types of chromosomes that you see on a karyogram when you look at human DNA. This is one of the first stages, and the reason why is simple. Heterochromatin is much more compact, it's much more tightly bound, and it's much more conducive to movement. It's also okay to have all of your DNA in the form of heterochromatin because we're not going to be replicating that DNA. We're not going to be doing transcription from that DNA. Essentially, we're just going to be moving chromosomes about the cell and dividing them and partitioning them into two different daughter cells. So the first stage of mitosis, as I've already mentioned, is called prophase. In prophase, the first thing you're going to see during early prophase is the condensation of the chromosomes into heterochromatin. Now, when you look at these chromosomes, they're actually going to appear to be almost sort of X-shaped. And the reason why is this. If you look at a, at a cell in prophase, you will see that there are 46 pairs of what are referred to as sister chromatids. So during S phase, each of the chromosomes was replicated to produce an identical copy of itself. These identical copies are actually going to remain attached to each other. They're going to be attached to each other at a waist called the centromere by, uh, by proteins known as cohesins. 
So they are actually held together. So in, when you look at a human cell in prophase, you would see 46 pairs of sister chromatids. And the thing to note about sister chromatids is they are completely identical to each other. This will be more important when we start talking about meiosis, and you'll see why later on in the video. Now, these 46 pairs of sister chromatids joined at the, at the centromere by these cohesin proteins will begin to organize themselves inside of the nucleus. But another thing you're going to notice during early prophase is that the nucleus is going to begin to dissolve. Remember, we're going to need to move chromosomes throughout the cell. Well, right now they're trapped in the membranous nucleus. That is slowly going to dissolve. So will a structure within the nucleus called the nucleolus. That is going to begin to dissolve as well. If you recall, the nucleolus is where ribosomes are born. Well, we're not going to be doing transcription and translation, so we don't need ribosomes anymore. Therefore, we don't need a nucleolus. Both of these will come back towards the end of the mitotic phase. Another thing you will notice is that during S phase, another cellular structure was also duplicated. And this is what is referred to as the centrosome. So the centrosome and at the center of a centrosome are going to be two orthogonally or oriented at 90 degrees to each other centrioles. Now a cell in prophase is going to have two centrosomes. These centrosomes, originally right next to each other, are going to begin to migrate to opposite ends of the cell. This is going to create the two poles to which chromosomes are going to move. Now, centrosomes are very important in animal cells because in animal cells, they are the microtubule organizing center. This is where the microtubules, remember those cytoskeletal components, that are going to be needed. The microtubules are going to be the tracks upon which the chromosomes move. They're also going to help to stretch the cell to lead to the production of two daughter cells. So these centrosomes are going to move opposite each other to end up on opposite ends of the cell by the end of prophase. These microtubules that are being produced by these centrosomes are going to form what's called the mitotic spindle. And these microtubules are going to be, the spindle is going to be the, the pathways on which the chromosomes move as well as maintaining the structure of the cell throughout the process. As the cell enters the or reaches the end of prophase, these microtubules will begin to extend to form the spindle. Some of these microtubules will actually attach to something called the kinetochore. So the kinetochore is a proteinaceous structure right near the centromere of the where the sister chromatids are joined together. These kinetochore microtubules uh, will help to push and pull the chromosome throughout the cell. The very important thing that needs to happen is each pair of sister chromatids will need to be attached to kinetochore microtubules from each of the two centrosomes in the animal cell. In other words, they will need to be attached to both poles in order for mitosis to move to occur appropriately. So as we get to the end of prophase, we will notice a few important details have occurred during this process. We will notice that in animal cells, the centrosomes will have moved to opposite ends of the pole. I keep saying animal cells for centrosomes because, quite simply put, plant cells don't have centrosomes. They have a different type of microtubule organizing center. I will point out differences between animal and plant cell mitosis as we go throughout. So let's assume for now that we're talking about animal cells. The centrosomes are going to be at opposite ends of the cells. Microtubules will now have begun extending from both of those centrosomes to produce the mitotic spindle. Some of those microtubules will now be in contact with the kinetochore at the middle where the two sister chromatids of each pair are joined. Each set of sister chromatids or each pair of sister chromatids will need to be attached to both ends of the mitotic spindle. In other words, kinetochore microtubules coming from both of the centrosomes. There will also be non-kinetochore microtubules. These are microtubules that instead of contacting the kinetochore of where the chromosomes are attached, will actually come in contact with non-kinetochore microtubules from the opposing pole. We will also start to notice that these kinetochore microtubules have begun pushing the chromosomes towards the middle of the cell and aligning them in the center of the cell. At this point, we will enter into what is called early metaphase. Metaphase is the next phase of mitosis. You will know that a cell is in metaphase when you look at it, and what you will see is that all 46 pairs in a human cell of sister chromatids are now aligned in the middle of the cell in such a way that one each of the sister chromatids is facing either pole. This is due to the activity of those kinetochore microtubules. In this invisible imaginary line where all of these sister chromatids are now aligned is referred to as the metaphase plate. This will bring us to the third and final checkpoint of the cell cycle. It's the M checkpoint. 
the cell will now pause at metaphase to ensure that all of the chromosomes are properly oriented and aligned to the metaphase plate and that all of the chromosomes are in contact with both poles of the mitotic spindle. This is very important because if this isn't, if these conditions aren't met, the remainder of the process may go awry and you'll end up with an inappropriate, uneven number of chromosomes in each of the daughter cells, which could spell disaster for, for the, the resulting daughter cells. If all of the conditions required by the M checkpoint are met, the cell will then proceed into anaphase. In anaphase, the microtubules of the mitotic spindle are going to exhibit two types of activity. First, the non-kineticore microtubules are going to extend and push against each other. This is going to result in the lengthening of the cell into almost a football shape. At the same time, the kineticore microtubules are going to begin to dissolve and shorten, with the result of pulling one each of the sister chromatids to either pole of the cell. This activity will be further necessitated by the removal or the dissolving of the cohesin proteins that are holding the sister chromatids together. As a result, each pole will end up uh, pulling 46 sister chromatids, um, one each of the pairs, to one pole while the other pulls 46 chromatids to the other. At this point, those chromatids are now separated from each other, resulting in the formation of distinct chromosomes. So in anaphase, what you start to see is the movement of each set of chromosomes to an opposing pole of the cell. This will proceed until all of the chromosomes have been pulled to each of the poles where the centrosomes now lie. And this fourth stage of mitosis will be known as telophase. During telophase, you still have a single cell, but this cell will now have two newly forming nuclei. So what will end up happening is the nuclear envelope is going to be is going to reform around where those chromosomes are now located at each of the two poles. You will start to see the reformation of the nucleolus, and you'll start to see the chromosomes go from existing as neat, tightly packed heterochromatin chromosomes, and euchromatin will begin forming as the cells begin to go about doing, or I should say the chromosomes begin to be utilized in order to, uh, to do normal cellular activity. That is the end of karyokinesis. So the first part of the mitotic phase is karyokinesis, the physical separation of the chromosomes. So karyokinesis is broken into four phases, as we've just discussed, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. But at this point, we actually haven't physically separated the cells. This is a process known as cytokinesis, and it occurs next. This is where another difference between animal and plant cells exist. In animal cells, such as human cells, a different cytoskeletal component known as actin is going to be involved. And you're going to end up with an actin ring forming around the, the middle of the cell. And this actin ring is going to slowly tighten and contract until opposing sides of the plasma membrane come in contact with each other. And not unlike you divide a bubble into two separate bubbles, you end up with two distinct cells as this cleavage furrow forms and eventually uh, forms two daughter cells. Plant cells can't do it this way. And the main reason why is plant cells have a cell wall. This, the division of, of plant cells into two daughter cells is going to involve something called cell plate formation. So if you remember the metaphase plate where the chromosomes were aligned during metaphase, as those chromosomes begin to separate from each other during anaphase, uh, special vesicles are going to uh, are going to bring a distinct cargo. These are called fragmoplasts. Uh, a fragmoplast is going to form where you end up with these specialized cargo vesicles with cell wall components aligning on the metaphase plate. During anaphase and during telophase, a new cell wall will begin to form right along the metaphase plate, dividing the two cells. The cell plate will eventually give rise to the new cell wall towards the end of telophase and actually perform the act of cytokinesis by physically partitioning that, that single cell into two daughter cells simply by the formation of a new cell wall. So there's another very important difference between animal cells and plant cells when it comes to mitosis. The end result of mitosis, whether you're a plant or an animal or a fungus, is going to be the production of two genetically identical diploid daughter cells. In this case, we've separated two identical sister chromatids from each pair of existing chromosomes, and that will result in a human cell in two diploid 46 chromosome containing cells. And each of those cells will have two copies of each chromosome, one paternal and one maternal, hence the term diploid cell. So now let's talk about meiosis. 
So much of what we talked about, I'm talking about in meiosis is going to be similar to what we talked about in mitosis. So for example, the cell is going to go through the same stages of the cell cycle, G1, S phase where the genome is replicated, G2. And the first difference that we're actually going to notice is going to occur in prophase one. Now you may be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, did you just say prophase one? Yes. So that's one of the major differences between mitosis and meiosis. While meiosis, we're still going to go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, we're actually going to do it twice. And to keep track of where we are in the meiotic process, we have to talk about whether we're referring to prophase 1 or prophase 2, metaphase 1 or metaphase 2. So let's back up and talk about what those differences are, or that major difference is. So as I mentioned, during the cell cycle, in meiosis, in a meiotic cell, what's going to eventually be a sperm or an egg, we are going to have S phase and each of the 46 human chromosomes is going to be replicated, resulting in the formation of 92 chromosomes. And just like we saw prior to mitosis, each of the chromosomes is now going to have a sister chromatid to which it's attached by cohesins at the central mirror. But when we look at a cell that's about to enter into prophase one, we're not going to see 46 pairs of sister chromatids attached at the central mirror. Instead, we're going to see that each pair of sister chromatids is now attached to another pair of sister chromatids to form something called a tetrad. But the thing to note is this. This pairing of sister chromatids with another pair of sister chromatids is not random. It's actually because those sister chromatids are pairing together with something referred to as their homologous chromosomes. So when we talk about sister chromatids, what we're talking about is an identical copy of one chromosome paired to its other identical copy. So for example, your paternal chromosome ones duplicated and now attached to another copy of your paternal chromosome one. The homologous chromosome for your paternal chromosome one is your maternal chromosome one. Homologous chromosomes are not identical, but they do contain the same genes at the same lo locations. Hence the term homologous. So for example, you have a gene in your body that controls your eye color. You get one copy of that gene on one chromosome from your father. That would be your paternal chromosome. There is a matching maternal chromosome with the gene for eye color. It may not have the same information. Your paternal gene may say blue eyes, where your maternal gene may say brown eyes, but they're the same gene at the same location. These are referred to as homologous chromosomes. So if we were to look at the tetrads inside of a human chromosome prior to prophase one, what you would see is the, the two copies of chromo paternal chromosome one paired with the two copies of the maternal chromosome one. Same thing for chromosome two, chromosome three, chromosome four, and so on and so forth. They are joined together through a proteinaceous structure called the synaptonemal complex. And this is going to be very important for the first major difference that we see between mitosis and meiosis during prophase one. This is actually one of the major important steps in, way in which meiosis diversifies genetic information, to in which is very important for sexual reproduction. This process is known as crossing over. Crossing over occurs when information from one of a pair of sister chromatids on one homologous chromosome exchanges information with one of the sister chromatids from another pair of sister, chromat sister chromatids from the other homologous chromosome. In other words, a small part of one of dad's chromosome ones is going to change information with the same corresponding part on mom's chromosome one, resulting in each pair of sister chromatids no longer being identical because one will contain all paternal information while the other sister chromatid will contain mostly paternal information and a little bit of maternal information. And then the converse is true then for the maternal chromosomes. This happens through the formation of chiasma or the site where crossing over occurs. Essentially what happens, not to get too far in the details, but a double strand break is introduced in each of the sister chromatids and the information simply switches place. It, it occurs through the formation of something called a holiday junction named after the scientists who discovered it. The end result is to diversify genomic information. At this point, even sister chromatids are no longer identical to each other since one each of the, one each of the pairs is referred to as the recombinant chromosome. 
it now contains some information that's been recombined with information from the corresponding homologous chromosome that pairs with it in the tetrad. Crossing over is a very important step in increasing genomic diversity. The big thing to realize is this. In a meiotic cell, every chromosome will cross over at least one time, but can do so often more than once, sometimes two or three times it can actually occur. So in a human cell, each of the 23 tetrads will have at least one crossing over event that occurs to exchange genetic information between homologous chromosomes. Now, what's going to happen next is all the things that you know from prophase of mitosis. You're going to have your centrosomes. They're going to begin migrating. Mitotic spindle is going to form. The tetrads are going to attach to the meiotic spindle, and they are going to begin aligning at the middle of the cell. And this will bring us to metaphase 1 of meiosis. This is where the second major difference occurs, and this is where a major component of increasing genetic diversity during sexual reproduction occurs because we're no longer aligning 46 pairs of identical sister chromatids along the metaphase plate. Instead, it's going to be 23 tetrads. And what's going to happen is a process called random assortment, because if you have 23 different tetrads lined up at the metaphase plate, they can orient either with the maternal chromosome facing one pole and the paternal facing the other, or the paternal chromosome facing one pole and the maternal chromosome facing the other. And each of the 23 tetrads does so randomly. If you want to account for all the different possibilities, this is taking two to the 23rd power, which is over 8 million different possible combinations that can occur just in the meiotic cell. Take into account the randomness of crossing over that now occurred, and this massively increases the genetic diversity or the number of potential outcomes for each cell that, enter, that enters into the meiotic process. Some estimates have this being as high as tens of billions of different potential combinations that can occur even if just a single crossing over event happens on each chromosome. This is astounding. So the next time somebody says, hey, you're one in a million, say, actually, I'm one in several billion, but thanks for the compliment. Now, this random assortment is very important because what's going to happen is just like we saw during metaphase of mitosis, these tetrads are going to separate from each other. Rather than sister chromatids being separated during meiosis one, it's or during metaphase one, it's actually going to be the tetrads that separate. So pairs of homologous chromosomes are now going to separate from each other and, and move towards the poles during anaphase one. And just like we saw during anaphase of mitosis, this is going to uh, have non-kinetic core microtubules lengthening. Kinetic core microtubules uh, are going to be shortening. The synaptic amino complex is going to fall apart. And the end result is going to be two daughter cells. Now, the thing to note is this. These daughter cells that form after, after telophase are going to still be considered to be haploid. And the reason why is they don't contain distinct chromosomes. Instead, they contain nearly identical copies now known as sister chromatids. So anaphase one proceeds as you would expect. Telophase one proceeds mainly as you would expect as well with a simple, uh, with a, a subtle difference. Rather than reforming the nuclei in the nucleolus in most cells, the nucleus isn't going to reform. And the reason why is we're very quickly going to go back into another round of karyokinesis. But first, we do need to do cytokinesis. We do need to divide these into two daughter cells. And this will happen just as we described during cytokinesis following mitosis or uh, in both animal and plant cells. But unlike we saw uh, with, with mitosis, where the cell kind of goes about resuming new, uh, new, uh, normal activities, following cytokinesis, this isn't going to happen. Typically, there's a brief period that follows cytokinesis known as interkinesis. But the thing to note is this, we're not going to go back through G1, S, and G2. During interkinesis, the cell will recover a bit, but we're not going to have another round of synthesis. We're not going to do another round of DNA replication. Instead, these two newly formed daughter cells are going to re-enter into the division process, and we're going to end up at meiosis 2. So we'll end up at prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, and telophase 2. 
Now, the thing to note is this. We're not going to have any more special steps like crossing over or random assortment. Instead, what we're going to see is something that looks very, very similar to mitosis, where the sister chromatids that are paired off are going to align in the middle of the cell. They're going to separate during anaphase and telophase, and then nuclei are going to reform following cytokinesis. The big thing to note is this. Unlike prior to mitosis, prior to meiosis II, there is no S phase. So there aren't going to be 46 pairs of sister chromatids aligned at the metaphase plate. There are going to be 23 pairs. And the end result of this process is each of those two daughter cells from meiosis I are going to result in two more daughter cells from meiosis II, yielding four haploid daughter cells. And because of the processes of crossing over and random assortment, in the end, we're going to end up with four non-identical haploid daughter cells. And this is very, very important in sexually reproducing species. It means that even prior to the formation of the gametes, which in and of itself, gamete fusion during fertilization to form a diploid zygote, that is in and of itself a way of mixing genetic information. The meiotic process itself helps to increase the genetic diversity of multicellular sexually reproducing organisms, which we now know is hugely important for the evolution of species. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We discussed the differences between the two major types of cell division that we see in eukaryotic cells, mitosis and meiosis. Remember that mitosis is reserved for somatic cells or body cells. In these cells, we're going to end up with two identical diploid daughter cells. The process of meiosis is reserved for the reproductive cells, the gametes, the sperm and the egg. And this is going to result in the formation of four non-identical haploid daughter cells, which are very important for increasing genetic diversity and leading to the formation of haploid gametes, which can then fuse to form a diploid zygote, giving rise to the next generation. I hope you learned a lot today. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll talk to you real soon.